Okay, um, just by way of introduction, this is something that arose from conversations I had with, we have, Josh and I had together some time ago, the idea for this session. I don't think it's ever been done before at TAG, so this is a... Or anywhere else. Or anywhere else, as far as we know. There's no, been, there's no formal relationship between archaeology and poetry. Now, you might think, if you're a sceptic, that talking about archaeology and poetry is silly. Uh, because archaeology is a science and poetry is definitely not a science. Um, but clearly, in many respects, archaeologists are concerned with the relationship between the past and the present. Time is the great theme of this tag, and how things past and things present relate to each other is a common interest between archaeologists and many poets. We mentioned several. 20th century poets, it seems to be one of the features of modernism in poetry that they, there is this concern. And I allude here to possibly the greatest of these poems, which is not in English literature, it's in Greek, modern Greek literature, and um, well, at least one of you in the audience will recognise where that is. That's the poem The King of Asine by George Seferis, uh, which, uh, so why should I stand here? <laughs> uh, George Seferis, which he wrote in 1938 and 1940, and it's about the difficulty of understanding the past, even through the medium of past poetry, and often ways in which philosophers and other people relate to the material remains of the past is often mediated by poetry. One can think of Heidegger's trip to Olympia as an example of that. And the other thing I think is quite important is that poetry has its own precision. It's not the precision of prose but it has its own precision, and that's, I think, something that archaeology can learn from. We can learn about poetic precision as opposed to the more prosaic, scientific kind of precision that we've been accustomed to or more used to. So with those two introductory remarks in mind, I think I'm going to move on to my paper. I think it's the one that follows on from that. So I'll put this one down, and I'll put something else up. Okay, and I want to start with um, one of the poets who's uh, made archaeology an explicit concern, and that's Jeremy Prynne. The poems of J.H. Prynne divide opinion quite sharply. Some critics, or some literary critics, especially in Oxford, see his poems as needlessly opaque, devoid equally of human feeling and any real lyricism, and worse still, without meaning. Others see Prune as Britain's foremost modernist, one unafraid to engage through poetry with the changing entanglements of the contemporary world and how we are bound up with things and with the past. Prynne certainly minds the language of physics, of astronomy, of econometrics and indeed of archaeology for new resonances, tracing in a sense the way our being, and I mean being in a kind of Heideggerian sense, is constantly being shaped by the unseen currents of commerce and global connectedness, where capitalism meets science. In these shifting sounds, the relationship between past and present is a constant theme. This relationship, which is never stable, is refracted through many concerns of which archaeology is one. Explicit engagement with the intellectual underpinnings of archaeology is manifest from the white stones onwards. If there were any doubt about Prynne's occasional habit, following to the doubt about this, Prynne's occasional habit, following T.S. Eliot, of using footnotes, should dispel it. This use of footnotes appears first in the glacial question, unsolved, which is within the, the White Stones, which is not about archaeology as such, but the closely related fields of Quaternary Studies or Geology. Aristeas, in seven years, in the same collection, touches on the question of the material culture of the nomads of the South Eurasian steppe, Scythians and so forth, and related archaeological debates. A note on metal, 1968, is a brilliant condensation of Gordon Child's thoughts on the origins and long-term consequences of copper alloy metallurgy. Here he anticipates a concern about the deep roots of capitalism, which appears more prominently in prehistory in the 1990s with things like Chris Chile's ethnography of the Neolithic. 
I note on metal is far from being a full endorsement, however, of child's view, being leavened in part by the observations of North American prehistorians, such as James B. Griffin and others, on the old copper culture of the archaic Minnesota, where metallurgy did not lead to money and the quantitative view of the world and the self. This is not the place to dwell on the question of why metallurgy took very different, a very different social as well as technological turn in Europe as opposed to prehistoric North America. But this does illustrate that Prynne's use of subjects is not predictably poetic. There are no rather fey metaphors about stratigraphy uncovering layers of meaning, for example. What mattered to Child matters to Prynne, and this is true of his engagement with other subjects. I am not saying here, in this example or in others, that Prynne is offering some kind of paraphrase of Child. Indeed, Prynne's poetry itself resists paraphrase, perhaps more than any other that of any other contemporary poet. Trying to characterise what a particular print poem is about, or trying to distill its meaning, as if meaning could be contained in a box and gift-wrapped in the language of literary criticism, is a vain exercise. Prynne's poetry is as much phonological and etymological as semiotic. Let us not ask what these poems mean, but what they do. What then do they do to archaeology and archaeologists? And what are they doing with archaeology? What are they doing to our notions of the past, how our times past relate to times present? Well, none of the poems are putting forth theories. If by that we mean general propositions. There is nothing in print that we can apply to archaeology. There are, of course, various ways of looking into the past, or one of the ways that the past touches the present. One of these, non-archaeological ways, is to look through a telescope into the night sky, in winter, when the cold, clear air makes the stars seem sharper. The stars we see are, of course, not the stars as they are now, but as they were several million years ago. This night sky seems to be the subject, or not the subject, the setting of the poem I will examine in more detail in Chimerian Darkness. The night sky seems animated here, cosmic vibrations and limbs. If there is a subject, and there is a, and there is in any sense, and if it's a he, is the subject, is it a he, we don't know, dips in and out of the night sky back into the present sublunary world. Despite the distance in space and time, the viewer on this earth and the faint star are connected, limbs of the same thing, coils wound together. This is then about the past and the present, but not it really as this connection is understood within archaeology, but rather astronomy. The only non-astronomical note is set by the title, in Chimerian Darkness. What can this allude to? The Chimerians were a shadowy ancient people who, in Herodotus' account, mainly in Book 1 and Book 4, raided parts of Anatolia, present-day Turkey, and at one point lived in what is now Ukraine and the Crimea. Geographically, they gave their name to several crossing points, not only land bridges, land bridges to the Crimea, but also the Bosphorus itself, on which Constantinople or Istanbul now sits. Is it then this bridging or connecting of the Chimerians which is being alluded to? If it were, this would not, however, explain why darkness is Chimerian, except in a very general sense that they live in darker lands to the north, from a Greek perspective. The Chimerians appear in another poem in the White Stones, Aristeus, in seven years. This is more explicitly concerned with the archaeology and Herodotus and ethnography of the peoples of the steppe, the Scythes and the Chimerians, and also with shamanism. Aristeus is a kind of shaman who goes north in search of the land of the Hyperboreans, where Apollo comes from. But again, what here makes Chimerians dark? Or why is darkness Chimerian? A clue here is to be found in an unlikely place. In the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge is a Greek inscription first studied by William Ridgway, once Disney Professor of Archaeology at Cambridge. Ridgway's rather self-satisfied portrait has stared down at generations of members and fellows of Gonville and Keyes College for several generations, and the print is of course one of the most distinguished fellows of Gonville and Keyes College. So here we are. In 1886, Ridgway deciphered this inscription once thought to be a runic inscription, 
which had been found in Bruff by Stainmore in the county of Westmoreland and associated with the Roman fort Verterae there. So originally antiquarians thought this was in some kind of room. And you can see why they thought that. That's where it's found. It is in fact in Greek and is a poem datable to the third century AD. One of the most northerly, not quite the most northerly, of Greek inscriptions. It is written in elegiac couplets, hexameters followed by pentameters. So that's it. Like many such epigrams, it addresses itself to a passerby, an Odites, and asks him first to greet and then to mourn the untimely death of one Hermes from Comagene, a part of Anatolia, modern Turkey, who went to the Chimerian lands too swiftly at the age of only 16. This is an extraordinary inscription to have come from Britain. So just in case you don't know which Greek, here's a translation, kind of a translation. Now, this is an extraordinary inscription to have come from Britain, which you may think of at this time of the year, especially to be in Chimerian darkness. And it is all the more remarkable for being clearly in a tradition of poetry that addresses a passerby that goes back at least to the 6th century BC. So this is in a long-standing poetic tradition. But I don't think here that the Chimerian land is the dark land of the north. Rather, the Chimerian land is that dark, unknown land to which we go after death. This land is rather like the night sky, in which the light of a fellow human, long gone, shines like the faintest of faint stars whose brotherly radiance can only be picked up by the extraordinary means of a radio telescope. This is the Chimerian darkness, which is, in this room, the subject of Prynne's poem. But it may be objected, offering an interpretation of the poem, a reading, is exactly what I should not be engaged in. I should rather attend to what the poem is doing. I might retort that this is exactly what I am trying to do. The poem is working on me, prompting me to think of these connections. Connections between past and present exist both in astronomy and in archaeology. In this and other poems, by print, time is often not experienced as linear, but as a series of loops that link a point in the present and a point in the past. These points might be a faint star from long ago, or a neglected inscription in a faraway land, foreign and strange to a lad from Comagene. These themes continue to concern print. While it may be difficult to detect an interest in archaeology after news from warring clans in the poems that came out in the 1980s and 1990s, this interest returns again with some force in kazoo dreamboats dating to 2011, with its allusions to Heidegger, Parmenides and Richard Bradley's astronomical or cosmological interpretations of Scottish stone circles. Again, Prynne seems to share our concerns with phenomenology and the problem of being in the contemporary world. We may not be able to apply print. Poetry cannot be applied. But the but archaeologists, as I hope I have shown, can benefit greatly from reading him. As I say to my students taking the history of archaeological thought course, read more books and read more poetry. Thank you.